Hi, welcome back to this mini video series where we build a financial spreadsheet uh, entirely from scratch. Um, if you haven't done so already, please go back uh, and check out the first video and work your way up from, uh, from there. It, this is a little bit of an unusual video in that I'm not going to be uh, adding further functionality to the model, but I'm going to sort of take stock um, and explain why we've done what we've done, where we've gotten to, and how the model fits together, sort of a, a midway summary, if you will. I'm also going to be correcting a couple of minor mistakes. Uh, you should expect those to, to, to keep popping up in a, in a uh, spreadsheet like this. Um, the next thing I want to do is I want to explain a little bit about where we go from here. Uh, so I think there are really two paths forward. Um, uh, the, the model is now at a stage where I think it's plenty usable for most people. And, and the one fork is I want to start building other uh, use cases. So so far in the model, we've assumed that uh, you're a 23-year-old person uh, putting money aside until you're 67 um, where you retire and then you start spending the money up until you're 90. Obviously, um, that's going to only be the case for a minority of, of, of uh, viewers. So I want to start building other use cases that uh, where we can use this kind of functionality, this kind of thinking to, um, to, to other uh, scenarios. Um, the other fork in the road is I want to show you... Um, how to add functionality to the model um, that's perhaps uh, a bit more archaic, it's more complex, um, and things I don't want to build into the main model, but for the very adventures, I want to show you how. This is stuff like fat tail distribution. Um, it's adding asset classes uh, to, to the model so that we don't just have fixed income or sorry, low risk asset and, and, and equities, but can add, add to the scenarios. There, there are major issues with that. Um, so, so be forewarned, and don't worry if you if you don't follow along. And that some of that, frankly, is a PhD in economics level stuff. Um, my name is Lars Croyer. Uh, I'm a former hedge fund manager who has written a couple of books about finance, uh, and I'm now doing these uh, videos as a hobby. Um, I'm not a financial advisor, so before you do anything I say in this or any other video, uh, please do your own work, take your own advice. Uh, but let's get back uh, to the spreadsheet. So here we are back at this sheet. Um, what I want to start by doing is actually save this all into a new workbook. Um, because we've done you know, a thousand calculations down here times uh, five iterations, um, and we do that in multiple sheets, it's you know, several hundred thousand calculations, which is slowing down um, my uh, slow, you know, s slowing down the recalculation at this point. I'm going to save it into a new book like that. I'm also going to save. Let's see. Two. Uh, I'm going to save the cheat sheet also into a new book. Move copy and two. Two. Um, like that. Uh, so there we have them. I'm going to go back and close this so it doesn't run any kind of calculations in the background. I'm going to expand that. Um, then let's rename this main model. Then what I want to do is I want to uh, correct a couple of minor mistakes. You see this number down here shouldn't be blue. It should be black. Um, then also another thing I noticed is that um, this percentage of total contribution, it really should be calculated on the basis of not this instance, but on the average total contribution. Now we could rerun the, the data table and have the average contribution, which will vary with each iteration. Um, but uh, as a slight fudge, we can just say, well, what did we contribute in total um, in, uh, in the base case? Uh, so in this case, it's going to be basically the sum. Um, we can put it here. This is the sum. Of all these numbers, uh, max total contribution, like that, underline it, and then instead of making this uh, this number, we make it this number, like that, um, and then let's make it so. Now that should be correct. Um, so that's a slight fudge uh, that we have to keep in mind as we're changing the model, but um, um, but it gives us a, a, a more accurate um, a more accurate number. Now, so what I wanted to do in this video, after these kind of admin things, is just walk through 
where we've gotten to and and um, where uh, I'm planning to take this video series. I want to start by emphasizing that uh, one of the things that cost me to make this video series in the first place was really this kind of um, almost annoyance I had that you know a lot of uh, people I know use these quite expensive really financial software packages and very often they have no idea what goes into them or how the calculations are generated and at least here we can see ourselves because we build it ourselves and I think that's the most powerful thing here so so what this is is a simple financial model that helps you figure out what your uh, outcomes are going to be depending on your contributions which are here the spending which are here the returns which are here or here and the allocations which are here so just to go through this specific case we're saying and uh, you're 23 years old you're putting 4,000 aside a year that grows in real terms so inflation adjusted by 3% a year it's also quite volatile and it also depends on the market around you, the world around you. I think all of those are pretty reasonable assumptions. If you wanted to change the number, we could make it 100 a year. This is, by the way, agnostic to currencies. So now you see how all the numbers change. Change that back. Um, and likewise with the spending. Um, in later videos, I'm going to run a bunch of different scenarios saying, well, you know, obviously not everyone watching this is 23-year-old and wanting to build a model that assumes they retire at 67 and then live to, to 90. Um, but we can run this very easily. One is if you want to save up for a car or you want to you know, want to see how much money you're likely to have in 10 years, uh, depending on, on various allocations. Um, so the equity assumption, uh, I made other videos that I encourage you to have a look at, uh, which basically says, unless you can beat the market, which most people can't, buy broad index trackers, um, uh, world equity index trackers um, and, and these return numbers are actually pretty reasonable estimates for how um, you'd expect that the equity markets do in the long run sort of four and a half percent above inflation is pretty reasonable we're assuming minimal risk assets I think of government bonds or uh, your bank deposits really as riskless which is not entirely correct um, but also only making 0.5 percent a year we assume a standard deviation of zero in the riskless case um, and 25% in equities. Um, and, and then what I, um, what I do in the model, um, and hopefully you're with me at this point, is so we do these all these numbers, it's the contribution, the spending, the allocations, and then we say in this case at you know, generating ret random returns because it reflects the risks of the equity market, um, we we have a certain savings at age 90 in this case uh, minus minus eighty seven thousand. um now then what we do is we rerun the model a thousand times because you can see up here that the randomly generated numbers that's just one state of the world think of this as a, like a thousand parallel universes where if you want to figure out uh, between the age of 23 and 90 um, what the range is, you run it a thousand times and see what the numbers are. And obviously, if you're the thousand luckiest person, you're going to get really, really rich. And if you're the thousand unluckiest person, you're not going to get very rich. You're going to get very, very poor. And and so those outliers are kind of nonsensical. Um, but then what we do is we have the worst five percent and the best ten percent, which are the numbers I'm clicking here. And then we can also say what fraction of the numbers are above zero and what fraction are above five hundred thousand. Um, we once in a while we have to remember to recalculate the the, the model because uh, if you have it automatically recalculate um, the 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 it will slow down the working um, your your working function. Then I had this section in here which is fees where I really just wanted you to understand how massive the difference is between active and passive uh, fees is. So basically, if you have pay people to manage your money for you, which is something I recommend you, you don't do unless um, you can pick ones that beat the markets, otherwise just buy the markets. Um, it's a slight fudge because I didn't want to build it into the model, just like I didn't want to build in tax and and, and, uh, and um, transaction costs. Just We can do that, but it just gets kind of messy. So, um, so here you have to copy and paste down the values. 
Should we do it right now? It, it takes about a minute. Um, so let's just say, then we go paste, special, and then values. Yeah. And then, so that was the passive. Then we do the same with active. I think I assume 1.75, we recalculate. Um, and then we do see how the numbers are substantially different. And you get paste, edit, paste, special, and the values. So there you go. So you see um, that the you know the iterations obviously mean sometimes you see slightly funny numbers, but on average it means you're gonna pay a ton of money to have have your assets um, um, have your assets um, managed by um, by. Uh, by an active fund manager and do it again. I think that iteration was a little funny. Um, copy, paste, special. There you go. Yeah. So you see it's a, you know, it's a, a pretty substantial number you'd end up contributing each time. It's very important that we're now assuming that the contributions are gonna vary. If you say, well, I just wanna see what happens if, I, if my contributions don't vary, you just put in a tiny number here, a tiny number here, and zero here, and now they're the same every year. You can see, you can see that out here. They, you can actually even have it not grow, and then they really are the same, like that. And now, uh, you know, it's a different but very, very simple model. So now you can uh, you can recalculate and say now I'm just contributing four thousand a year, spending ten thousand. What do the numbers look like then? You see, then in the no risk scenario. Um, the numbers don't change. Uh, so let's just, just undo. There you go. So, um, so that's really where, where we've gotten to. Obviously, um, going forward, there are a couple of things that I, I want to explain you how to do in the model that you don't have to do. Um, uh, I'm also not going to build into the model in the interest of keeping it relatively simple. Um, one of the things is um, I want to have it so that your allocations um, let's just recalculate this. Your allocations are dependent on um, how well you've done. So basically, the richer you are, the more risk you can typically afford. Um, and we can build that allocation in automatically. For example, if you're Bill Gates, um, you probably wouldn't have a 50-50 allocation because you can afford to take more risk. Um, now, but if you're down to your lost, your lost dollar, um, or whatever currency, you, you probably shouldn't have even 50-50 in equities. So we can have that be dependent on how the, the, the world has done around you in, in the intervening years. Um, that's one thing. The other thing I want to build in is we have assumed a normal distribution of returns in our random function. Um, in reality, uh, evidence points to that um, there's fat tails in... Uh, the distribution of equity returns, which which basically is another way of saying that highly unlikely cases, bad cases, happen um, more than than uh, suggested by the normal distribution function, and that's called fat tails. It's actually fairly high level finance, um, so I don't want to build that in, but I want to explain how you could if you're feeling adventurous. Um, so this is basically saying if you know if you just believe the normal distribution function, a three standard deviation in event would happen every thousand years, whereas in reality it would happen sort of every 20 years um, and, and incorporating that. The next thing um, I want to build in is multiple asset classes. And uh, this uh, is kind of a, an, an odd topic because, again, I think it's something I'd love to see how a lot of the software packages do this because I bet they don't get it right. Um, it's not easy to get it right. So let's say we want to add commodities and real estate and so forth here. What to calculate a random function, you need to have the an estimate of the correlation between the assets. Now, correlation um, is one of these massively overused words in finance, but it really says how can you um, estimate how the, the how they move relative to each other. So, you have a correlation of one um, assets move in perfect lockstep. You have a correlation of negative one; they move the perfect opposite. And a correlation of zero, uh, there's no uh, you know there's no rhyme or reason how they move relative to each other. The problem is correlations change. They change all the time. And it's hard to say how they change depending on the world around you. And 
correlation tends to go up massively in drawdowns. Um, so I think it's just it gives us this false sense of diversification if we just put in a static number. Um, and you got to keep in mind these models are always sort of a little bit, um, pardon my French, but bullshit in, bullshit out. We can put a lot of numbers in here, and if we just don't really think about the numbers, then um, assume that it's right. We've got to be very careful about stuff like correlation. And, um, and, and, and I want to keep this very, very simple and usable. Um, now, I also want to talk about the, the main reason I want to do this model is because I always get so annoyed by, it. let's say, you know, um, let's say I want to put aside a thousand uh, euros a year. Um, and what will I, will I have 20, well, I for sure have 20,000 in, in 10 years. Now, I always find that's kind of like a misleading question because I won't necessarily for sure have it. But depending on how I allocate it, so you see the range up here, I can have a pretty reasonable estimate of the probability that I have it. And that's really as much as I can hope for. Um, and, and I think because that will help us guide our lives with how um, understanding how much... Um, uh, our allocations impact the probability that we will have enough money. Um, and, and I think that's pretty key. So uh, these kind of things I want to do in, in future videos. Um, and um, you know, one is you know, people saving up for, for, for down payment for an apartment. One is someone asked me, well, if I have 10,000 now, um, how can I understand the range of what I'll have in 10 years? And that was pretty simple. Someone said, um, if, I have, if I'm 40, um, how much do I need to put aside to have X when I'm, when I'm um, 65? We can build that in. So I'll do all that in, in, in future videos. Um, but I hope this little summary has been useful to you. Um, as always, I really um, appreciate feedback and, and, and comments, so, uh, so, so please do so freely. And, um, and I'll revert with, with them some of these build out cases in a, in, a, in a future video and also in the use cases which i think are quite are quite useful so thanks for watching i hope that was interesting and useful um please subscribe to my channel if you want to hear about future videos um or you can share this video on social media if you think your friends would benefit from watching it uh, but in any case i hope to see you uh, again at some point in the future